what is a clinical trial? So any drug, any device, any treatment that we give to a patient needs to be studied uh, to make sure it's safe and is uh, effective. Uh, we cannot just treat you with whatever we think uh, is going to work. Uh, we need to make sure clinical trials are done with every single treatment and, uh, and the medications that you receive today or the, or the interventions that you get or the uh, devices that you use uh, are approved because clinical trials were conducted uh, for uh, each of them and uh, thousands and millions of patients have participated in clinical trials um, over the years in order for us to benefit from the treatments that are approved right now. So um, every breast cancer drug needs to complete the clinical trial process before the FDA approves the medication uh, for cancer treatment. And same applies to things that we use for surgery, radiation. Uh, we all have to go through the same very complex and uh, a lengthy process. Uh, the, the sad thing about all of this is that only 5% of patients participate in clinical trials. And, um, and is, this is very different if you compare to the pediatric population with children, most children go to very specialized centers and most of them participate in clinical trials. So children are usually treated on a, on a clinical protocol uh, about 80%. And that's why we've made so much progress in treating uh, childhood cancer as compared to adults. Only 5% of adults participate in clinical trials. Um, and, and we're, of course, always very grateful to the patients that are willing to participate, and not just for their, for, for their benefit, for their treatment, uh, but also to advance uh, the field um, of uh, breast cancer. So why do we uh, participate in a clinical trial? So there, there are many reasons um, we, we want to participate in a clinical trial. Um, of course, it's important to contribute to medical research um, because, that, again, that's the, that this is the only way we're going to um, uh, advance the field and find a cure for 100% of women and men with breast cancer. So you want to contribute the, to the medical research. Um, do we, the, we are benefiting from the treatments that we're getting today. We benefit from all those women and men that participated years, uh, years ago. Access to care. Access to care is very important. Uh, patients that participate in clinical trials get very good care because it's not just your doctor taking care of you. It's a huge group of people behind uh, making sure everything is done perfectly. Everything is done without deviations. The protocol is followed meticulously. Uh, so, so it's very important that, um, that, you know, when you participate in a clinical trial, you get the best care possible, because again, it's a, it's a big team um, of people behind it. Um, also, we participate because we want to have access to better treatments, to, to uh, the, the things that we're testing today, we're comparing to the standard of care. So we know they're uh, as good as the standard of care, but maybe they're better. And, and for that reason, you want to participate in a clinical trial because you have the option of maybe getting something much better. And also, uh, the clinical trials that we're conducting today are improving quality of life because, for example, in the, in the area of uh, chemotherapy, we're all trying to move away from chemotherapy, trying to, to uh, come up with treatments that are not as toxic as chemo and, and like that, improve quality of life. Um, so there are many reasons, many good reasons to participate on a study, and we'll go over some things. Every person that participates on a clinical trial, uh, uh, we have very clear rights, and you need to be aware of those rights, so to make sure uh, they're respecting your rights when you are a participant on a clinical trial. Uh, we are obligated to tell you all aspects of the research study, the good, the bad, side effects, everything related to the study, things that could happen uh, if you participate. Um, we, we have to explain also how these treatments differ from the standard of care. Uh, you always have the option of doing the standard of care already FDA approved or participation on a clinical trial. Uh, you need to know all the potential side effects uh, that you may experience during the, the, conduct, the, during the clinical trial. And um, you also have, uh, you're also aware of, uh, uh, again, good and bad, the benefits that you get from the clinical trial, as well as the side effects and, and, and possible things that can go wrong. Um, if, what, what to do if we have a complication? Uh, who's the person that is gonna be managing the complication? Usually it's the principal investigator on the clinical trial. Um, we have to tell you all the choices you have, not just the study, but also what are the other options in terms of standard of care? Um, we need to give you all the information related to consent, 
things that may affect your decision. Again, the good and the bad. We need, we, the, the, the investigator has to be very honest uh, with you and tell you everything that could happen. We need to ensure your privacy is protected because yes, we're sharing information with, with the sponsors for the clinical trial. It could be the National Cancer Institute. It could be, um, the, uh, it could be a pharmaceutical company that is testing a new drug. So we're sharing information with them, but we always make sure your identity is protected so they know that is um, uh, participant number 003, but not, uh, not Alejandra Perez participating on the study. We need to protect your privacy. Um, you have the right to ask questions at any time. You have the right to remove yourself from the study. If you don't wanna participate anymore, you can always say no more, I'm, I'm done. Uh, and, you, and we finish participation, we complete participation in the clinical trial. Um, we want to make sure you, if, if you agree, you're not coerced in any way or pressured in any way, and you can always refuse to take part of the clinical trial, and that's not going to affect your care. You know, you, you always uh, say to patients here, you can participate or not, and if the patient says no, nothing changes. Uh, you continue the treatment of that patient just with the standard of care. Informed consent is a very important part of the clinical trial process. Um, and, and again, that's when we ensure that you understand everything that is going on with the clinical trial and, um, and, and where we explain everything, the purpose of the research, we describe the, the, the process, what are we doing um, in terms of the, of the treatment, how often, um, how many times do you have to come to the clinic, is it an infusion, is it a pill, you, we discuss everything related to the study and that's part of the consent form. And by you signing that document, you, you're pretty, pretty much telling us, okay, I, I know everything about the study. I understand everything perfectly well. And us, as, as investigators, we also sign the document um, saying the same thing. I explain everything to the patient. I give him all the options. I give him all the information uh, related to the study. And if you have any questions or any concerns or anything, do, you do not sign the consent form. Uh, it's very important that, that you know what you're doing and you understand every single aspect of the study. And, um, and then you are also entitled to receive a copy of that consent form with all the information that we just discussed. Um, so you maybe you read it again at home, you share it with family members, with other physicians. But it's important that you have a copy of that consent form um, to take home with you and, and for your records. So when, you, when you're talking to your oncologist, it's always very important uh, to ask uh, certain questions, and that's why it's so important to be well informed. So a, a good question for your oncology is, do you participate in clinical trials for breast cancer? Because you want to have that option. And sometimes doctors in the community don't have the option of uh, participating in clinical trials, but us in, in academic centers, uh, Sylvester, or, you know, other academic centers in the state or in the country, um, we can help with that. And some patients come to us as a second opinion to see if we have any clinical trial available. And then we can, we can work with your physician in the community. Um, they do the, the care that they've been doing and they continue with that, but they come to us for, a, for participation in a clinical trial if that's what you wanna do. So we can work with your physician to make sure you have access to clinical trials. So that's one question that you have to ask. Do you participate in clinical trials? And if the answer is no, then um, you ask, uh, okay, so who do you work with that, that we can, that I have, uh, that I know I have access to clinical trials. And they can tell you, okay, I work with Sylvester, I work with MD Anderson, I work with, you know, academic institutions around the country. And then the other question that you're going to ask your physician is, do you think a clinical trial would offer me something different, something new, something that I don't have access right now? And, and, and your physician is gonna tell you if that's the case or not. You're gonna ask, of course, about the risk of participating in a clinical trial. And also um, be familiar with what are the institutions close to you that have clinical trials. And, and many of the centers around, uh, around the area have some clinical trials. And, and so it's good to know what is everybody um, offering in, in terms of um, your disease. And, and that's a very simple search that you can go to the to clinicaltrials.gov is a, is, a, is a web page for clinical trials and you can search your particular disease. Let's say I have triple negative breast cancer and I want a clinical trial in the metastatic setting or in the adjuvant setting. And they tell you the list of institutions that are participating in that particular trial that you're interested in. So, so again, information is, 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 your, is your power. 
So also it's important to understand how clinical trials work. And when we say this is a phase one, phase two, phase three study, what do we mean by that? Because that's really how we get a drug from the very early development in the lab to an approval by the FDA. So we first do all the preclinical uh, data. So that could be um, studies in animals or studies in, uh, with, with cancer cells in the lab. Uh, so everything that is preclinical, meaning that we're not treating patients yet. So we do, we, we get an idea if the medication is active, the mechanism of action, um, and we see if, if this is something that is worth taking into, um, into the patient care. So when we do phase one, that's the first step. Phase one clinical trial is the very early stage where we pretty much look at safety. Is this safe for me to give to a patient? And, and of course, we get an idea about efficacy as well, but the purpose of the phase one clinical trial is safety. So you look at side effects, you look if the patient is doing well, you, you're, you're finding out what's the appropriate dose of the medication. Do I give 10 milligrams? Do I give 20 milligrams? And you test all the, all the doses. And once you know the dose that you think is safe for the patient, that the patient is not having significant toxicities, that the patient is able to handle it, then you know is is safe and you have the dose. So then you move the clinical trial to a phase two. And phase two is where you uh, test, uh, test it in the clinic and patients receive the drug and uh, you're gonna be looking at efficacy. Is this working for you or not? And, um, and, and also you're looking at side effects uh, as well. So phase two is more about safety, about dosing, and then you start getting an idea if the medication is effective. Once you have that information and the medication looks promising and you're excited about this medication that it seems to be working well, and the patients are doing well, then you move to phase three. And phase three is really where you compare to the standard of care. So let's say I've been uh, treated with tamoxifen and tamoxifen is a very good medication for, uh, in terms of hormonal therapy for breast cancer. But then I'm testing drug A and I'm gonna compare tamoxifen to drug A to see which one is better. And that's the phase three. You, you get assigned to a group, you can get drug A or drug B, and then you're gonna find out which one is the most effective drug. And once I know if it's an effective drug and if it's better than standard of care, then um, the, the medication gets approved because now I know it's safe. I know patients can handle the medication well, side effects are, are, are manageable. And I also know that the medication is, is um, as good or, or better than the standard of care. So that's when the medication is approved. And then sometimes we continue with a phase four, just for medications that are already approved uh, but we're looking at long-term side effects. We're looking at different things that we, we may not have all the answers already, but the medication is already approved and the patients are already using it in the clinic. So those are the phases of uh, the clinical trial. So again, very important. That's another question to your physician when they're offering a clinical trial to you. Is this a phase one? Is this a phase two, phase three? So you have a, a good idea of what you're getting into. Um, and, and why are these all these phases important? And I think that the, the message here with this uh, graphic that, uh, that you have in front of you is that we, we start with a lot of hope and, uh, and, and, and you, you think you know, the medication is gonna make it from the preclinical, from the lab to getting it approved by the FDA, but only about 19 to 20% of drugs that we test get approved. So again, it's a very lengthy process, very expensive process, and, uh, and it takes all that, yeah, it takes a long time. It takes years for us to take a medication from the lab to the, um, to, the, to the clinic and to get it approved by the FDA. And from 10 medications that you test, only two are gonna get um, approved by the FDA. And um, this is just the, the pathway that we use uh, when, you, when you go to the clinic and, and you wanna participate on the clinical trial, how, what's the flow that we use? First of all, we, we have to know if there is a clinical trial available for your particular disease, because all these, all these trials have uh, criteria to participate in, the, um, in, in, in these studies. And, um, and, and you have to know if you, if you qualify for the study, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Uh, so is a trial available? Am I um, eligible to participate in this trial? then who's discussing the trial with me? Is it the doctor, the research nurse, the coordinator? 
who's going to be discussing the trial to me. And then at the end of the day, am I, am I going to be offered that trial? When I know that you qualify for the study, can I offer the trial to you? And then the last part is you participate, you agree to participate or not. So that's, that's pretty much the flow uh, every time we have um, a, a patient in front of us and we're interested in a clinical trial, we go through this uh, process. So talking a little bit about the myths of clinical trials. So we know that clinical trials, they're, they're not the last resort. Patients think, oh my God, I have, I have no more options. Uh, I need to go for a clinical trial. And that's not tr true. Uh, patients participate in clinical trials at all levels. You could participate with early stage breast cancer. You're doing great. You just want to find something that is going to help you for a particular problem. And we'll talk a little bit more about the different types of clinical trials. Um, or, um, or you can participate when, when, let's say, I don't want to do chemotherapy yet. Let me try different drugs first before I do chemotherapy. Uh, so it's not, it's not like your last resort. It's not that last thing that I have to do. No, we have clinical trials for all settings, for patients that are doing well, for patients that are sick. We have clinical trials for all places. Um, the other myth is that clinical trials are only for patients with advanced breast cancer, and that's not true. We have patients with early stage breast cancer that participate in clinical trials all the time. And in fact, we start the research with patients that have advanced breast cancer, and, and, we, and we move those clinical trials that we know are effective. We move them also to the early stage, um, um, the early stage disease. Uh, so everybody uh, has uh, the potential of participating in a clinical trial, regardless of the stage. Um, the, other, the other myth is that if I participate in a trial, I may get placebo. And, and that's not true. Uh, we will never give you placebo when we know we have to treat your cancer. That would be totally um, unethical. There are some studies, uh, let's say for, um, let's say I, I conduct a trial about um, acupuncture and in management of half lashes. That's a trial that we can compare to placebo because we know we're not interfering with, with your treatment for breast cancer. We will never give you placebo as treatment because again, that's totally unethical. But if we're testing something, let's say to, to um, treat a symptom, a side effect, you know, that's when placebo is used. So you need to know if the use of placebo is appropriate for you. Um, do you need to live uh, next to a large clinical, a, a large cancer center? And that's not true. We all participate in clinical trials. For example, Sylvester, uh, yeah, they we're in Miami, but, but for example, my office is in plantation. So we bring those clinical trials to everybody in the community. So, so everybody uh, has access to them. Um, if I choose to enter a, a, a clinical trial, I have to stay on it? No, I told you one of your rights is that you can come off a clinical trial anytime. Um, do I have to pay for the cost? And, um, and that's something that is discussed in the consent, when we do the consent um, and you sign the consent form. Uh, some things are built to your insurance, what we consider standard of care. So uh, standard of care could be a blood work or uh, the visit to your physician. Some things are standard of care and those get built to your insurance, but, all, but the medications, the, the study drugs, um, or any procedure that deviates from the standard of care, the clinical trial has to pay for that. And, and again, that's something that is explained to you up front. And then the, the, probably the biggest myth is that we are all uh, guinea pigs. And uh, if we participate in a clinical trial, and that's not true, patients benefit from studies all the time. And the, uh, one of the advantages of participating in a trial is that I could have access to a drug that is gonna be approved by the FDA five years later. And, and in cancer, we don't have time to, to wait for FDA to approve. So a good way to get access to those drugs is through clinical trials. Um, one of the things that we pay a lot of attention is participation by minorities in clinical trials. And unfortunately, we do not do a good job. Most of the participation in clinical trials are bad, uh, by uh, non-minorities. Uh, most of the studies you see, for example, there, if you compare uh, white population versus the non-white or Hispanic population, is, um, is very small. And we need to have more representation of minorities because we treat a lot of, uh, of, of this population and we need to know how um, every, every race, ethnicity um, uh, manages side effects. Uh, it could be different. We, we see differences also better in certain uh, population and not in another one, or some population can have better um, um, management of side effects as compared to another one. So we need to really have accurate representation of our population um, to, to make sure 
you know, we test the drugs in, on everybody and we can treat all patients uh, the same. So we always encourage uh, minorities uh, to, to really explore uh, this option. So this, um, this is just to give you an idea of what's, um, what's required. In order, let's see, this for example is a, is a case uh, of, of breast cancer surgery and how things have made, uh, have made, we made so much progress in surgery going from these horrible mastectomies that used to leave women uh, totally uh, deformed and, and the chest wall was, was uh, horrible and we didn't have reconstruction. And that was, you know, 50 years ago that we have these very radical mastectomies. How we will be moving from the, the radical mastectomy to a modified radical mastectomy to a much better lumpectomy, um, or, or maybe in the axilla, we used to remove uh, all the lymph nodes in the axilla. Now we know that we don't have to do that, that we can uh, really uh, go down to a sentinel lymph node and, and decrease the risk of lymphedema. So uh, you see there through the years, uh, 1970, 1980, 1990, and all the clinical trials that were conducted there um, in order to get to where we are right now, that we do less surgery, less uh, lymph nodes removed, and patients look better, feel better, less lymphedema. But it takes, it takes so many, uh, um, so many, so many uh, clinical trials to get there. And each of these trials is thousands of patients. So in order for us to go from a very radical procedure to a much better procedure in terms of quality of life and, and, and good outcomes, um, you could study 20,000 women uh, that have participated in clinical trials for us to get there. Um, so again, a very lengthy process. Uh, we're always very appreciative of, of all the women that have uh, participated in clinical trials because thanks to them, we are where we are now. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what's, what's different uh, in the last few years what's uh, changed in terms of the standard of care in terms uh, for breast cancer. And I'll give you some examples of new drugs uh, in clinical trials and some things that are coming down the pike. Um, we have the CDK46 inhibitors. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. mTOR inhibitors, uh, medications like TDM1 or Katsyla or TDXD or Inhertu. Uh, so we, we've made so much progress and, um, and I'll show you some examples why those clinical trials uh, uh, brought us these new drugs uh, for the management of breast cancer. So look at, for example, here over the years, what are the drugs that we've been using and, and the approval? So starting from the 1970s, when we only had tamoxifen, that was the only drug available. And then um, we discovered 20 years later in 1990s, we discovered the aromatase inhibitors. So those are uh, Femara, Arimidix, Aromacin. And then in 2002, so another 10, 12 years later, you, you get a medication like Fulvestran or Fastludex. And then another 10 years later, you get medications like Affinitor, Everolimus, or you get Ibrans or Palbocycliv, uh, uh, Quiscali. I mean, so many new drugs, but you see from one to the next is 10 years. It's 10 years because conducting these clinical trials take a lot of time. Um, uh, so just to give you an idea, this is a very cumbersome process, very lengthy process for us to go from the first medication we have, tamoxifen, to the drugs that we have um, nowadays, it's almost 50 years of research and participation in clinical trials. So the, the drugs, the new drugs, uh, the CDK46 inhibitors that we give for patients with advanced breast cancer uh, that have um, hormone positive uh, breast cancer, uh, these are just an example of uh, some of the clinical trials we conducted in order to get those medications approved. And I'm talking about palbocyclib or Ibrans, or um, abemacyclib or Versenio, or uh, ribocyclib or uh, Kiskal. Uh, so those are medications that we had to conduct all of these clinical trials to show that by adding those medications to hormonal therapy, we were improving um, uh, what we call progression-free survival, meaning that you can live longer uh, without, every, without the disease getting worse. And that's a very important uh, marker. So when you have advanced breast cancer, these medications really change the standard of care. And I, in the past with advanced breast cancer, we, we only treated uh, patients with hormonal therapy, but now we have uh, these drugs that can uh, improve outcomes in patients with metastatic breast cancer. And that's why the treatment for uh, advanced breast cancer when you're estrogen positive 
advanced breast cancer. That's why the treatment has changed so much. And you have, you see all of these new drugs that, were that, that, that are approved now thanks to participation in clinical trials. You see here all the CDK46 inhibitors, you see uh, Fasolodex or Fulvestrin, Alpelisib, uh, which is a medication that was approved not long ago for tumors that express um, uh, an alteration called PIK3CA. Uh, so those are things that your doctor is looking at to see, are you estrogen positive? Do you have a PIK3CA mutation that I can give you this new drug? Um, what, what are, the, what are the, um, the, the characteristics of your tumor, the genetic material of your tumor that is, that, that is going to make you respond better to medications like this? So I'm just putting this graph out there to see how much the treatment for metastatic breast cancer, especially the estrogen positive breast cancer, has changed over the years. And we have so many new drugs. All of these that you see here is, is, is pretty much new in the last um, uh, five years uh, that, that we've been uh, using them. Um, one of the biggest advancements in breast cancer that we, that we just uh, had uh, is the latest medication to be approved is, um, is a medication called TDXD or Trastuzumab deruxtecan, or the commercial name is Enhertu. And, and this medication was just approved in, you know, few, few, several weeks ago. Um, and we presented the data on this clinical trial. We, I, I was a principal investigator on this clinical trial. Uh, and this is for, for a new class of uh, tumors that we call HER2 low. So traditionally we had patients that uh, were HER2 positive or HER2 negative. And for years we had just those two categories, HER2 positive or HER2 negative. But now we know that within the HER2 negative patients, the HER2 positive, we're gonna treat as HER2 positive and they, they have access to all the medications that we give for HER2. But in the HER2 negative category, now we know that some patients have some expression of the HER2 protein that is not completely negative, that they have some expression. And those are what we call HER2 low. And this medication in HER2 uh, was proven to be very beneficial in those patients. So what we did with this clinical trial we compared patients that, had metastatic, that have metastatic breast cancer, they were assigned to one of two groups. Uh, one was the study drug, the transtuzumab, the rupstican, or the and the other one we compared the other group received chemotherapy, just the standard of care chemotherapy. And what we saw was a significant improvement in not just progression-free survival, but also overall survival, so meaning patients live longer if they receive this drug. And, um, and you can see here, there's a big difference in the two groups. Patients live longer, uh, it's a drug that is very well tolerated, um, but the most important thing is that it's a new class of drugs. And thanks to this clinical trial, we, we have now a, a new defined category of breast cancer that is called the HER2 low. And it's very important that you go back to your physician and say, am I HER2 low? I, I was told that I'm HER2 negative, but am I HER2 low? Um, and, and to see if you qualify for this medication. Your physician, and we're all doing it, we're going back to that old pathology to see if you're hurt too low or not, to see if, you're, if you qualify for, uh, for this treatment. So that's in general um, the process for clinical trials and, um, and some of the most important and latest uh, clinical trials that led to the approval of all of these drugs. So now I wanna focus a little bit on the clinical trials that we have available at our institution and any other uh, in the area clinical trials that are looking at different concepts. I'm not going to bore you with the design of the clinical trial because it can get, uh, it can get too heavy. Um, but just, to, just so you get an idea of what things are we testing in, the, in, the, in, in this uh, study um, and to see if you qualify for, for some of them if you're looking for other options. So let's start with um, this medication, uh, camisestrin. So camisestrin is, an, is also a new class of drugs. So many of you may be familiar with Fastlodex or Fulvestrin. Fastlodex is a medication that is a, is a form of hormonal therapy that we give as an injection once a month uh, for patients that have metastatic breast cancer and, um, and, and, and they're estrogen positive. So we give Fastlodex once a month. Fastlodex is a class of drugs called SIRDS, and, and SIRDS stands for um, uh, select estrogen down regulators. And, and camisestrin is a form, is similar to Fastlodex, but is, is uh, a pill, is, uh, is a tablet. Um, so it's good because we're taking that injection that you get once a month, and some patients hate that injection, 
um, and you're taking it in an oral form. So um, camisestran is going to be studied, is being studied in the metastatic setting in patients with advanced breast cancer. But this particular trial that we're going to be opening soon is going to look at patients that uh, have early stage breast cancer and have been on hormonal therapy for uh, at least two years. And we're going to switch to this medication to see if patients do better. Um, so we're going to compare, and you can see here the two groups. The, the one group is the standard of care. We leave you on the, medic on the treatment that you're getting, uh, which is the hormonal therapy that your doctor selected for you. Um, and the other group is going to take this new drug to see if, if we can improve on the standard of care. So this, is, this, ca this class of drugs, you're going to see more and more. And these are the oral um, um, estrogen down regulators that are similar to Faslodex, uh, but it's a new option. And we hope that uh, FDA is gonna approve one of them very soon. We think about in December, we hear that in December, it's gonna be another option for hormonal therapy. So this is a clinical trial that we're gonna be opening at the center uh, very soon. Um, the only thing that we, we are doing a lot of work on is precision medicine. Precision medicine means that we look at the genetic material of your tumor, we analyze the genetic material and we know if your tumor uh, has a particular abnormality that makes it more sensitive to uh, uh, drug X. And why is that important? Because when I started in this field 20 years ago, we used to treat everybody the same. We, we didn't know much about the biology of the tumor and everybody got the same chemo and everybody got the same radiation, everybody got the same hormonal therapy. Nowadays, we know that every tumor is very different and we analyze the genetic material of this tumor, and that's what we call precision medicine. What is so unique about your cancer that I'm gonna treat you very differently compared to the next patient that has maybe a similar disease, maybe estrogen positive, HER2 negative tumors, but they have a completely different uh, biology. So the precision medicine trial that we have at Sylvester is called the TAPER trial. TAPER trial is um, in collaboration with the American Society of Clinical Oncology with ASCO. And what we do is we test the genetic material of the tumor. We take the tumor, we take the, the results to a tumor board, um, what is, is a molecular tumor board, uh, where um, we are guided by big experts in the country. And they tell you, try this particular medication because this patient has this mutation that we think is going to work better for, for, for her, just for her. And, um, and, and that's what this tapered trial is doing. So when you have advanced breast cancer and you're looking for options, we can test, we can do the genetic analysis of your tumor and see what medication works for you. So this is a very interesting trial that, that we were, were enrolled hundreds of patients and we're, only, we're the only site in South Florida to have it. So something that you can uh, look into. And, and this is the explanation of how TAPER works, but it's exactly what I just told you. We analyze the genetic material, the patient signs an informed consent. We present the, the case to a molecular tumor board and then they tell us what medication we can try. And of course, we follow you for toxicities and for efficacy. Um, another, another concept that we're studying in metastatic breast cancer is uh, this concept of the androgen receptor. So um, most patients, we know if you're estrogen positive, progesterone positive or negative. So for years, we always tested estrogen and progesterone. But now we know that androgen receptors also play an important role in, in breast cancer. So we are testing medications. It's another form of hormonal therapy, if you will, but it's not targeting the estrogen. It's targeting the androgen. And, um, and we're testing this drug that is an androgen receptor blocker. Like let's say tamoxifen is an estrogen receptor blocker. We're testing this medication that is an androgen receptor blocker. And that's um, uh, a, a novus arm. And this particular trial is comparing this new drug to just the standard hormonal therapy, XMS stain. It could be with everolimus or not. You know, that's the standard of care for, for many patients. So this is for patients that have already received, let's say, an aromatase inhibitor, Femara, Remix, one of those, in combination with Ibrans or with Versenio. Um, and and the, the disease got worse. Uh, if, they, if the tumor is androgen receptor positive, we can put you on a clinical trial like this. And again, my intention is not to bore you with these clinical trials, but I just want to give you an idea what are the concepts, what are the things that we're studying right now in clinical trials uh, for breast cancer. So androgen receptor is something else to pay attention to. And if you have metastatic breast cancer, it's a question that you should ask your physician. Am I androgen receptor positive or negative to see if this may be an option for you? 
um, Bria cell is a vaccine. So I wanted to give you at least um, an example of, uh, of the studies that we're conducting with vaccines. Uh, we, we've done many. We just concluded one uh, vaccine trial for triple negative breast cancer. Bria cell is, a, is another vaccine that is combining with some form of immunotherapy. Vaccines, as you know, is a form of immunotherapy. So this particular trial is uh, given in patients that have metastatic breast cancer that they're uh, progressing. We're combining this particular vaccine called Bria cell with uh, another form of immunotherapy, and the names are there. And um, we give it every three weeks and we analyze the response. And this, this particular trial is available at Sylvester and, and is very easy to, to, to participate on, on this study. So if you're looking for an option, if you're looking and if you want to do um, uh, immunotherapy, uh, because immunotherapy right now is only available to patients that have triple negative breast cancers or they have PDL1, which is another marker that you could respond to. to, to uh, immunotherapy, uh, but this particular clinical trial is available to patients that are hormone positive, um, that you wouldn't get it, uh, you wouldn't get immunotherapy uh, otherwise. So again, options uh, to tell you about. Uh, we also have an interesting trial uh, that is looking at this therapy called radium. Uh, radium is um, a radioactive material, uh, is already approved in patients with prostate cancer, uh, but it's never been tested in, in patients with breast cancer, and that's why we're doing the clinical trial. And it's for patients that have bone metastasis. So what we're doing is when you have bone metastasis, let's say you look at this bone scan here. So everything that is dark is, is bone metastasis. So this, this patient has bone metastasis in the shoulder, in the spine, in the pelvis, here in the ribs. So those are uh, bone metastases. So these patients are getting taxol, paclitaxel, or a form of chemotherapy, in combination with radium. And the radium is supposed to go to all the bones in the body to, to try to uh, make it better. And you can see this patient that participated in the study, look at how good of a response she had on taxol and radium uh, for, for the management of bone metastasis. If you compare the two cases here, you see that the, that the lesions are less intense, so the patient is doing much better. So again, bone metastasis, this is a good option. Um, is a radioactive material, but you know, when you have bone metastasis, one of the treatments that we use all the time is radiation. So it's very similar, but, but the difference here is that radium goes everywhere in the body. When you, have, when you do radiation for advanced breast cancer, you just target one particular area. You do the shoulder, you do the rib, or you do the spine, but you can't do the whole body because you can't give radiation to the whole body. But this radioactive um, a substance is safe to give to the whole body. It's injected, and, and, and you can see excellent results there. Um, we're also testing the HER2 area. Uh, so this uh, particular trial um, is looking at new medications in patients that are HER2 positive. So tucatinib, for example, is, uh, is a medication that has been very useful in patients with HER2 positive disease, especially if the patients have brain metastasis. It works well. Um, so there, we're, we're doing a series of clinical trials, and this is just one example, testing this medication in patients that have advanced breast cancer. Um, and, and this particular trial is looking at the combination of TDM1 or Catsila with tucatinib uh, compared to TDM1 and placebo, meaning that the patient for sure is getting TDM1 or Catsila. But uh, what we're trying to study here is by adding tucatinib, are we, are we making it better? And um, this study is also going on. And, and, and we hope that combining these two drugs is gonna improve upon the standard of care. Let me go to, um, let me see how we're doing with time. Yeah, I wanna leave time for questions. Uh, so I'm gonna skip some of these trials. So I also, I, I didn't wanna just talk about, um, about uh, uh, drugs and medications. I also, uh, wanted to give you some ideas of things that we're doing in terms of um, psychological aspect of the disease, um, uh, complementary and alternative medicine, or um, all the things that are not just medication, because we have a big uh, supportive care services at our center, and we study uh, every aspect of the disease, from the actual treatment to what's affecting you, psychological, nutrition, exercise, lymphedema, uh, many things. So I wanted to give you just a few examples of what we're doing in that arena. For example, this clinical trial is called V-SMART, 
and um, and is uh, designed to uh, deal with stress. Uh, when you're diagnosed with breast cancer, of course, a very traumatic uh, experience and very stressful. So um, this particular trial is for women recently diagnosed with breast cancer that already had surgery um, and they haven't started treatment yet because we wanna see the before and after. And, and this clinical trial is trying to help women um, deal better with the stress that the disease brings. And, um, and it's a video conferencing intervention. So you meet with a therapist um, and you have sessions with a therapist through video, uh, trying to give you the tools that you need to manage the stress. And, um, and we're also looking at your immune response. So, so we're, also doing clean, uh, we're also doing blood work, looking at how uh, the stress um, can compromise the immune, your immune response. And we're trying to learn from that as well. So, so again, I, I wanted to give you like a different aspect of the clinical trials because they're equally important uh, to treat quality of life and the way you feel. And um, I also wanted to give you an idea of uh, for one of them. It's just, uh, I chose, you know, a few, we have many on, on how do we um, study complementary and alternative medicine. I don't like to call it complementary and alternative. I, I like to call it integrative because we're really working together here. Um, for example, um, this clinical trial is looking at a particular preparation, topical preparation for patients that are undergoing radiation to see if we can help with the, with the burning of the skin that you get with radiation. Um, so we're giving this, uh, this product and we're testing, we're seeing you know, how toxic radiation is for the skin and we apply that topically and, and we, we have assessments uh, to see if, um, if we can help you with different preparations because we, we all use the same creams and the same things when you're, when you're getting radiation, but we're trying to find uh, better ways to, to, to treat you. So um, again, another example of, of studies that I'm doing. Um, I'm going to stop there. I, I love this diagram because this shows you how complex this is. These are all the pathways that are important in uh, treatment of, your, of, your, of breast cancer and, and how we have to target all of these pathways and how uh, each medication works in a different pathway, in a different aspect of this graph. And uh, so it's a very complex area. And that's why we need so many of these studies to really help us understand what's um, happening with, um, with, uh, with, with the tumor and, and how is that tumor uh, behaving.